Do you ever feel like an author would just hate you if they met you in person? Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's Lit Life with Miranda Reads and today we're going through the worst books I read in 2020. So before we get into this, I do want to say a couple of quick things. I want to definitely make sure to note that not all books are for all people. Books that just didn't work for me might work great for you. They might be life changing for you. But this video is all about books that I read that just eh. Okay, so let's get started on the worst books that I read in 2020. So the first one I have is kind of more of an honorable mention. It's like it was an okay read. It just didn't gel with me. I'm talking about Chains of Gold by Cassandra Clare. Now, Cassandra Kaleyer is the author of the immensely popular Mortal Instruments series. It has, I swear, at least 10 books, possibly more with the spinoffs at this point. So Chain of Gold is actually happening in the past from the Mortal Instruments series. We follow a series of characters who are a little more than like names on a page from the original series. And then Chain of Gold follows their lives in kind of the Victorian era and what it was like being a shadow hunter and all that jazz. I think my main issue with this one is that I did not read the 10 plus books of the series. I've read the first Mortal Instruments. I kind of read, I think like half of the second and then my enthusiasm for the series just kind of fizzled and I never picked it up since. And the way the Chain of Gold is written, even though it's kind of being shown as the first of a new series, the world building, the characters, the lore, it all feels like something that's in a very established world, which makes sense given it's part of a big series. However, as someone who's pretty much new jumping into it, I felt very lost by the characters, the plot. I had a struggle connecting to the book because I just didn't feel particularly interested and I feel like that's because if you come into this with the knowledge, you're like, oh, well, how does this fit in? How does this fit in? What's that plot hole from like book three? And then you can kind of figure it out all through there. And that could be very good. But as someone who is brand new, it just didn't work for me. Then we have number 10, Good Boy. This one is written by Jennifer Finley Boylan. This one's on here because of mostly expectations. When you pick up a book, called My Life and Seven Dogs. I feel like you have expectations. One, cohesive timeline. Two, a strong presence of the dogs in the book. And three, that the author likes the dogs, of which I did not get much of any of those three. With Good Boy, we follow Jennifer's life. So it hits her early childhood when she was a boy, it hits her transition, it also goes into her adulthood and kind of discovering who she is. Of which I love the concept of that, I love overlapping that with the dogs. However, I think most out of everything was the timeline. Now she has written, I think three to four memoirs already. So this is like the fourth go around for her. So she's trying to hit events that we have not seen in the previous memoirs, at least I'm assuming. And because of that, it felt like I was getting a very disjointed view of her life. Like we'd have this event in the past and then we jump kind of future and then we go back and then we have current Jennifer reflecting on that and then we go back again. And we kept having so many time jumps that I would lose track of the storyline and what was happening. So the second thing you'd really expect from this is dogs. I mean, it's called Good Boy, My Life and Seven Dogs. The dogs weren't really present. Like they were there, they would show up, but the emphasis is on her life, which is something that I would expect from a memoir. The emphasis should be on your life. But if you talk about like, this is gonna be through your life through dogs, you would expect the dogs to be very present in every chapter, like life lessons, cuddle time, sweet you cute boy. Like a lot of those moments and how that affected her life. But what we got was more so like, the dog showing up in the beginning, maybe a page in the middle, and then kind of at the end of the chapter. I really just kind of expected there to be a stronger presence of these dogs. And the last thing that really threw me from this book was the likability of the dogs. Looking at these dogs through Jennifer's eyes, they just didn't seem very 
likable. Like it's um, maybe it's more like she didn't like her dogs. If you look at the dogs, like there's the one that would get boners, there's the one that would hump everything, there's the one with the eye boogers that would drool on her pillow and get the booger smeared all over until she kicked him off of the bed. It just, it didn't feel like good moments to share. It just felt like, oh, you really didn't seem to like the dog because that's the only things you can really remember about them. And I'm pretty sure like that's probably not the truth, but just from her eyes and the moments she chose to share with us, I don't know, like maybe I need to go for a reread. Maybe I need to check out her other three memoirs in order to get context for this book. But I just kind of like left it going disappointed. You know, where it's just like, okay. So then the next one we have, so at number nine is Red Hood. And this one, I affectionately call it the period book. Obvious reasons. As you might have assumed from what I just said, it is literally all about periods. A lot of blood. Okay, so in this one, our main character gets her very first period and she gets all this extra strength and power and she goes off into the woods, finds a boy about to attack a girl, he transforms into a wolf, and she kills him. And then she finds out that in her family, the bloodline means that whenever the females go on their periods, evil men turn into a wolf and then the females kill them etc. So this is one of those books. One, it was in second person. So that really threw me a lot more than I thought it would. But two, it's one of those books, the more you think about it, the more plot holes that come up. Why is it only the guys that are evil? Why is it that if they have not committed a crime, i.e. if she interrupts them or if even before they do a crime, they still transform into wolves? Are you really saying that people are just so evil all the time that if they should be killed they'll just turn into wolves and then it's fine. So I got kind of annoyed with that. The main character made a quite a few questionable decisions especially considering how much we know nowadays about DNA evidence that just really threw me from the book and prevented me from enjoying it. Eight is The Roxy Letters. So The Roxy Letters follows Roxy obviously. She has a dead-end job, her ex stole her artwork, made a lot of money, and now she's not inspired to do art anymore. She's living with a different ex-boyfriend, renting out the house, and it's just kind of like her life as she goes through different hijinks and tries to make her life marginally better. So what got me for this one is the humor. It's very cringe humor, but like not in the way that I can handle it. Like I love Office very good. That has great level of cringe humor where like you're like ah, but it's also so pretty funny. This one was more cringe than humor for me. There are so many moments where I'm like oh my gosh no sweetie don't and she would do it anyway. It really annoyed me that the main character was just so irresponsible all the time and I'm like you are 30. Put your ass together. It was just very much a, this is happening to me and I can't do anything about it. And that frustrated me as well. It's definitely not a book that you'd want to read with your mother, to put that mildly. It was just a lot of very sexual situations and um, conventions around sexual situations, which I think were supposed to be like very humorous, but like, it just flew over my head and it did not work for me. Now, so number seven might surprise some people, and she's actually going to be on this list twice, so it's going to be perfect as boring. And this one is written with another author. So, like, it's Tyra, but also, like, the other author does, I think, like, a lot of the background work for it, making it from ideas to story. And the reason why I'm saying that I'll become a parent when I get to the other Tyra Banks book on this list. <laughs> perfect as boring just kind of felt like, I'm trying to find a better way to phrase this, but it felt fake to me. And what it does is it really goes through all of these different controversies that Tyra has gone through and it just gives it a very positive PR friendly spin. Like a really, really long, really well written, but like purely PR statement. And throughout this book, Tyra Banks always just is shown to re respond perfectly, poised, calm, collected. And even when she breaks, it's because of her deep, deep love for everyone. And to me, it just felt... Like it wasn't a real book, if that makes sense. It felt like someone said, okay, these are the controversies. 
Tyra wants him to be swept under the rug. How can we spin this so that the people will believe it? And I might just be like too many seasons into America's Next Top Model kind of controversy, conspiracy thinking here. The title Perfect is Boring kind of fits it. It's kind of like a perfectly written book and it was kind of boring to me. I just, eh. Number six is The Shadows Between Us, which honestly is probably one of my most disappointing reads of the year. This book follows Alessandra. She has a goal in life and she is set to get it. She wants to meet the prince, get him to fall in love with her, marry him, and then kill him. So it's a very simple four-step plan. So this book, I will admit, the concept, stunning. The first four to five chapters, stunning. The rest of the book, flatline. So the issue I had with this one is that it started so well. Alessandra was a woman who was not afraid to kill to get what she wants. You see in the very first chapter, one of her boyfriends kind of like dismissed her. He's off. He is dead. And then we get to the part where she meets the prince and it's just very, oh, I gotta wear this outfit. Oh, I gotta plan this. Oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I need to step back and let things happen. And it's just kind of like this whole book built off of anticipation. It got boring to me because it was so much focus on about what her potential and what her plans are and getting her plans in line that by like the 200th page, I'm like, can we just do it already? I'm sick of hearing of it. Can we kill him? I'm, I'm ready. Let's, let's kill him. And obviously because this is YA, they don't go full hardcore murdery. So yeah, it, it just felt like a very much of a letdown to me. Number five is The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. And I'm so sorry that it has to be on this list because I love Emma Donahue and it just did not work for me, did it? This one's set in Ireland when it's at war and there's a pandemic going on. We found Nurse Julia in the maternity ward. She has a new doctor come in. She has a new helper come in. And we just have like a single night or so where they talk about like what it was like to to save people, to lose people, and it's very poignant, memorable, it's that sort of thing. So I do want to preface with a lot of people have loved this one. And I feel like maybe if I was more of a historical book person, I would love it too. But unfortunately, I'm not. So the biggest thing I ran into this book was I was bored by it. And I just had a hard time getting into it because I was just constantly tuning out then tuning back in and then realizing I missed some details, but not caring enough to go back for it. So it could possibly just be the way I read it. Maybe I just needed to be in a better mood for a historical. But yeah, it was just, it was just boring to me. I just couldn't get into it. Number four is, uh, you guys knew it was coming if you follow my channel, because I've talked about this one a lot already. And this will hopefully be the last time I talk about it for a while, but luster. This one follows a young black woman as she is struggling in her job. She meets Eric, a white man, starts to have an affair with him. Then she meets Eric's wife and they come to an arrangement. And this book is supposed to be a dark humor book according to the Goodreads description and that's why I always cite when I talk about why I didn't like it. Essentially, I didn't find anything funny. To me, it was a very bleak, very depressing outlook on this woman's life. The characters in it felt very flat and cold to me. And I really didn't have a single thing that I wanted to like jump onto and love. Because a lot of times a bad book can be saved by a great character or a great plot twist where I'm just like, okay, that's my thing. And I focus all my energy and enjoying that. I couldn't find anything like that in Luster. All right, number three, um, Milk and Honey. Milk and Honey is a series of very, very short poems. As you guys know, I am not a poetry person. I am very, very bad at enjoying poetry. The poems in these are very, very short, which conceivably should be okay for me because I like to read books fast. So a short poetry book works. However, with poetry, like the way the lines are spaced, the way everything is laid out, means that you're supposed to like read it slowly and think about it and enjoy it. 
and yeah so that doesn't work for me because I don't really like to do that again like I do feel like I have to keep prefacing this but like I am NOT a poetry person I have not been trained in this other than high school English so like if you are a poetry person you might have a completely different interpretation which is amazing and I'm glad that you enjoyed it but for me personally this felt like an Instagram book like you know like those pictures on Instagram where it's like this beautiful landscape and they have like this very short sentence about how like appreciating the beauty that never was but always should be like that but then she would like break it up so it's like appreciating the beauty always was never would be where it's just kind of like a full sentence is split up on one page I feel like this one is one of those books I just I didn't like it because I didn't get it so at the number two spot is The Evil Queen by Gina Showalter. Now, <laughs> oh, Gina, do you ever feel like an author would just hate you if they met you in person? So in The Evil Queen, we follow two twins. One is supposed to be the good twin, one is supposed to be the evil twin. They get transported to a magical world and it is just like them trying to figure out who, what their destiny is. Okay, so I've been trying to do my take on why this book has hit the number two spot for roughly 20 minutes now. And it just got me, and it's just pretty much me angry ranting at the camera about why I hate this book. Um, to summarize, one is that it relies heavily on cringe humor. Not like The Office cringe, not like a cutesy cringe, it's just full out cringe. It's like the level of a middle school boy who shouts something in the lunchroom, the lunchroom goes dead silent, everyone looks at him, and then goes back to what they're doing. It's like that kind of like cringe that you want to ignore. The characters aren't real people. And I cannot emphasize this enough, but they just don't feel like real people. One, the cringe stuff, but two, it's just, it feels like Gina has never met a high schooler in her life. The things that she has them do, think, say, do not match with my memories of high school or like anything I've seen pretty much everywhere. For example, I'm going to keep it kind of vague because it kind of gives away part of the plot but also kind of doesn't, but one of the teenage characters is forced to marry a king who has a son that's her age that she likes. So the teenage girl marries the father of the boy she likes. It's forced marriage. Honestly, don't really see that it could be legally binding whatsoever, but then something happens and now she is a single step mother and she spends the rest of the book thinking about her stepchildren, trying to guide them, trying to care for them. No concept of her being actually 17, but the way she just glomps onto that stepmother role was annoying to me because it just, it didn't make sense given the context of the book, given real world life stuff, etc. Oh gosh, I'm getting ranty again, aren't I? Long story short, too cringy, characters don't feel real, plot is conveniently convenient for anything that the author wants to happen, and the plot itself just goes in circles. Like, it's just kind of like, whatever whimsy the author wants, that's where the plot goes. And the very last one, so my number one worst book in the year, is written by Tyra Banks as Gen, and this one's called Madeline. The concept of Madeline is so big <laughs> that I really have a struggle of trying to find a way to sum it up. And it's not like it's like a big like R.R. Like Martin, George R.R. R. Martin's books. It's just like I really don't understand half of it and I read the whole book. Essentially, we follow Tookie. She is the least favorite of her parents. Her parents love her, their daughter, their other daughter more. And there's this model land which teaches you to be a model, which actually gives you superpowers. Now, at one point, there is a smize that lives in their water. And if the smize comes out of your sink, you have an increased chance of becoming a model land model by like some X percent. And Tookie gets the smize, but then no one believes it. And then she has to go try out anyway. It's a lot of like circular logic and inconsistencies in plot, character, dialogue, development, everything. Now this is the book that was written purely by Tyra. 
So the other one I talked about earlier, it was actually written by Tyra and then a real author who I strongly suspect took Tyra's ramblings and turned it into a book. You read Model Land and it is 110% ramblings. Like there are concepts in there that sound really interesting, but it's not written as a story. And what I think happened was just, she just never listened to feedback. She never let editors take her work, pull it apart. And she never had beta readers, which I feel like is a very important part of a story because you can have the best idea, but if it's not communicated clearly, concisely, and in an interesting manner, it just falls flat. So long story short, a Jai almost got as ranty as a Gina book. Maybe I should consider like tying them for first but it did not work for me. And I feel like this one could be an okay story if they cut out 200 pages and half of what happens in this book and really focus on character development. Because I feel like that is what is really missing from this one. So yeah, that's it. Those are the books that really, really, really did not work for me this year. I am really curious though, what were the books that were not your favorites for you? Are there any books that you regret reading? All right. Thank you so, so much for watching and happy reading. Bye. Ooh, before I forget. So there is a book out there called Pete's Exhaustive Review of Model Land, which is like a 60,000 word review of her book. And it is absolutely hilarious and it made me appreciate the experience of reading Model Land. All right, I'm going now. Bye.